Welcome back crew, College of Southern Idaho, Evergreen Building, my classroom. Uh, this is our next <clears throat> video on minerals and today we're going to focus on the feldspars. The feldspars are a family of minerals, um, very important, uh, the most common uh, and abundant mineral in Earth's crust. Um, we are going to keep this at a, at a specific level. I know some of you will want to see the whole feldspar series from albite to anorthite to oligoclase and, and everything in between. Um, but I'm going to keep this at a level that I think will benefit the most people, uh, which is a level of competency, but not getting too deep in the weeds. So hopefully that will work for folks. Um, let's see, let's go ahead and get started here. Let's see what, what we've got. So, um, oh, first of all, uh, someone asked about books or resources. Uh, <clears throat> rock and mineral books. Um, these are dated, but I'm sure they have newer editions. Um, the Simon and Schuster's book is probably my favorite quick reference. Um, it has minerals uh, organized um, in various ways. It shows uh, percent abundance with these symbols here. So the more red, the more common it is. It shows the crystal form. And so you can kind of go through one at a time, you know, copper, uh, different ones here, here's spinel, um, and read information about like what crystal system is, is, how it looks, where you would find it. I think this is a pretty handy reference. Uh, it also gets into rocks in the latter part of the, the book. So this has been a, a pretty helpful reference for me, the Simon & Schuster's book. Again, you can probably find a newer edition of that. Uh, and then I also like the Peterson Field Guides. Um, those are pretty nice as well. And so um, fewer photos. I think they have all the photos as plates in the middle. Um, so mo mainly you're just kind of running through different mineral systems and reading their properties, characteristics, so on and so forth. Uh, and then I'm trying to remember where, where it has rocks. Um, maybe it's at the very back. Uh, anyway, this one is a pretty helpful reference as well. Maybe a little bit meatier in terms of content and technicality, but two great references there. So if you're interested in getting something uh, to supplement your rock and mineral identification skills, um, I recommend uh, both of those. And I'm sure there's other references as well. Those are just the two I'm most familiar with. So let's get started with the feldspars. So feldspars are a group of minerals, a family of minerals that contain aluminum, silicon, and oxygen and then various amounts of either sodium, uh, calcium, or potassium. These actually substitute for each other in the chemical composition. So depending on the specific feldspar you're looking at, what family member you're looking at, that will determine uh, which one of these you have in it. Uh, in general, the potassium and sodium feldspars tend to be lighter in color. The calcium ones tend to be a little bit darker, but we'll kind of look at that in a little bit of detail. As I said, most abundant mineral in Earth's crust uh, one of the most, most characteristic features of the feldspars is that they have two cleavage planes at 90 directions. And so what that means is that the crystals in rocks will tend to have sort of a rectangular or blocky shape to them. And that's really important and a very diagnostic trait, one that will help hopefully help you differentiate it from quartz or other minerals with which it might be confused. So the two cleavage planes at 90 directions, which I'll show here in a second with some samples, uh, is really important. Um, most feldspars usually also have uh, striations, little thin lines that run parallel to each other on the cleavage plane. So again, I'll, um, I'll show you some of that here in some detail. Uh, the hardness of quartz, it's about six on most hardness scales, so it will definitely scratch glass, although you may have to dig at it a little bit. Uh, but it's softer than quartz. Um, I suppose I could demonstrate that really quick. I gotta go over here to the mess and grab a glass plate. And we can just demonstrate this uh, very quickly for those that are interested. So there is my glass plate and grab the mineral and sort of just grab a corner really kind of dig at it and then sure enough if you kind of use your fingernail there you can feel the, the grooves in it you probably can see those scratches right there as well so definitely harder than glass but uh, softer than quartz uh, which will also be important as we kind of talk about feldspars 
occurrence in sedimentary rocks. And an interesting note about uh, feldspar crystals is they can occur sometimes as twins. I looked through my collection, I didn't see any, but I do not have here at the College of Southern Idaho an extensive you know, mineral collection, definitely not a uh, you know, museum quality collection. So I'm gonna try to get my hands on uh, a feldspar twin so I can show that maybe at some other point. But you can look online, you can kind of see what those look like. Basically it's two crystals nucleating next to each other and so you get uh, two mineral crystals of feldspar that are conjoined, um, that share space, and so they're, they're not fully formed geometrically, but you can kind of see their, their overall shape. Um, this is deep in the weeds, but I just, for those that care a little bit, this is what's called the ternary diagram, this triangular diagram, and this is our classic ternary diagram for the feldspars. We're going to mainly just call, stick with the plagioclase feldspars, and what we call the alkali or the potassium feldspars. We're going to kind of focus on this range here. Fundamentally, um, these are the two main groups of feldspars, but if you want to get deep in the weeds and look at the full feldspar family, uh, you can see some of these other names here. You can see their percentages of either sodium or calcium or potassium. That's what forms the three points of the ternary diagram, uh, and you can get deep in the weeds. So you might see some of these other names like sanidine, microcline, uh, labradorite, um, in other references. So just know that they're part of the feldspar family, okay? But for our purposes, we're gonna just mainly focus on two specific types of feldspar. <clears throat> we're gonna look at potassium feldspar, which we're gonna right now just uh, abbreviate to K-spar. So there you go, there's a fun nickname uh, for this kind of long, long named mineral. And then plagioclase feldspar, let's just call that plage. So we have plage and K-spar. Potassium feldspar tends to be kind of pink, peachy in color. Sometimes it's white, but we're gonna stick with this color here because this is the more common color. Um, plage is typically milky white to kind of light gray. Remember that they'll all have the two cleavage planes at 90 degrees. So let's take a look at these. I'm gonna set up the, someone suggested the tripod thing, and then I realized that I actually have a tripod on my little camera thing, so. Oh, this is great, a, a, a still camera, and I can actually uh, hold it up with two hands. So here's a great example of potassium feldspar. Um, you can see the kind of peachy salmon, kind of flesh colored. You can also see some of these parallel, uh, sometimes called striations or lamellae running through it on the cleavage plane. Notice the cleavage plane here is very uh, flat or level. It also reflects the light really well. So there's one of our two cleavage planes. And then as we rotate over to this side, we can see another planar surface that reflects light. There's our second cleavage plane there. And then we can see that they intersect at this angle here on the side, this nearly perfect 90 degree angle. And then you might see on the other side, you can still see uh, some of those cleavage planes as well. So there's that top one we looked at, but notice there's some other lines running through there. Those are the cleavage planes. So if I whack this thing with a hammer, it would have a tendency to break along these planes, which are parallel to these two primary uh, cleavage planes. There's a weathered surface of, of the feldspar, so uh, kind of grungy looking, and it doesn't la it lacks the reflectivity and the uh, planar, uh, um, the flat surface that defines the cleavage planes. You might see other little flashes of light in there, those are just parallel planes. So there's our big plane right there, uh, down here by my thumbs. But if I just rotate over, you can actually catch some light in these two little planes here by my thumb. Uh, those are just smaller cleavage planes. So a great example of potassium feldspar. There's another one, so K-spar. Uh, so the color I think is most distinctive along with the shape. And then we have <coughs> its uh, sibling, plagioclase feldspar, which tends to be again, kind of white to lightish gray. Uh, we can see the striations, the lines running through the mineral on the cleavage plane. So here's this big cleavage plane uh, reflecting the light in front of you here. Um, remember two cleavage planes at 90 degrees. Let's see if we can find the other one. This one's pretty obvious. If we rotate around, we're kind of seeing a grungy side here, not much reflectivity. Uh, come around to this side, not much. Um, but then, this is kind of subtle here. Then over here, there's a little face right here that is reflecting the light. Let's see if we can get it to flash a little bit in the camera. There we go, right there. And even though it's small, it is planar. There's a little bit more of it on this side over here and down here, <clears throat> but that would be the second cleavage plane. And then you can sort of uh, see the intersection right here where it's about 90 degrees. 
So here's uh, plagioclase. Here's another one, a little maybe better example with that one perfect cleavage plane there. And then there's a second one right here. So again, kind of looking at it end on, we can see that 90 degree uh, surface there. So, so those are your two new friends, potassium feldspar or K-spar and plagioclase feldspar. Uh, and we looked at some of their properties. Uh, let's head back over here before we look at the rocks <clears throat> and go through some other important characteristics with these. So when feldspars weather in very wet climates, um, not so much in Idaho, although up in the mountains, this might be more the case, but not here in the Snake River Plain where I live, um, they tend to break down chemically. We don't need to go through the reaction, um, but uh, the, the carbonic acid that's present in rainwater or groundwater can dissolve the feldspars and chemically turn them into clay minerals. And a lot of times in the rocks, they'll start to look kind of chalky on their weathered surfaces. So that, that's an important point, is that feldspars in wet climates don't last very long. They, they tend to break down chemically. They're not nearly as robust as something like quartz. <clears throat> um, igneous rocks. Well, in igneous rocks are incredibly common, both extrusive rocks that come out of volcanoes, intrusive rocks, which are rocks that form underground, like granite, magma chambers that cool slowly beneath the Earth's surface. Um, they typically form really big crystals. We sometimes call these phenocrysts in porphyritic rocks. Porphyritic rocks have big and little crystals. Um, we're going to spend a whole bunch of time later on igneous rocks. So if some of these terms uh, are a little bit, uh, you're kind of lost in, in the woods a little bit here, don't worry, we'll, we'll circle back to some of these definitions and spend more time on them. But they often form big crystals. That's an important point to make. <clears throat> uh, the case bars tend to be a little bit more common in our lighter, colored or silica rich, sometimes we call that felsic igneous rocks, whereas plage is a little bit more common in the intermediate rocks, a little bit darker in color, a little less silica, <clears throat> and plage can also be in some mafic rocks like basalt. Um, so let's take a look at what these look like. We'll set the tripod back up again so I can, I can use two hands. And then I have another cool thing here that hopefully will wow you. So here's Here's a nice sample of uh, granite, kind of a classic granite. And in here we can see these big pink feldspar crystals. Uh, we've talked before about the quartz. So the quartz in here is sort of more of these kind of grayish. Let's use this little pick without the bent end. Oh yeah, that's great. So these would be the quartz crystals in here. Uh, here's the K-spar. And then if we get in here close, uh, the places where we can see the white, that would be the plage. So now you know at least three minerals in this kind of classic granite. You've got your quartz uh, and the gray zones in here, kind of a translucent, these very large and obvious peachy colored case bar crystals, the plage crystals. Uh, and then our next mineral series will focus on these dark minerals and we'll, we'll identify these dark minerals in the granite. So there's, there's a nice little granite there. Uh, this is a piece of Zoroaster granite from the bottom of the Grand Canyon. This one's very pink, a little bit different looking granite, but as I rotate it around in the light, you can see some of these surfaces reflecting the light. And the beautiful thing about when you see in these intrusive igneous rocks or extrusive rocks, whenever you see those flashes of light, that's, those are cleavage planes. So that's telling you that you've got a mineral that has at least one uh, good cleavage plane. And so in this case, a lot of those are feldspars. There's also some uh, quartz in here as well, like up in this zone right here. Um, but a lot of this pink in here is case bar. And so, and there's a little bit of white in here as well. So kind of a classic um, or a different looking kind of granite. Let's see what else we got. Um, another granitic rock. Um, and some of these may not be true granites. I sort of lump them together. Some of you igneous petrologists may already be yelling at the video thinking that, well, that's a monzonite and that's a, a whatever. Uh, so there's, a, there's our quartz, uh, K-spar. And then this one has plage in it as well. Uh, these kind of white zones in here. And again, the black minerals, which we'll look at later. So another granitic rock. Uh, I got a couple more of these of just different crystal sizes. This one has, wow, really big, beautiful, sexy um, case bar crystals. Notice how this one is forming a rectangular crystal. So we can see those two cleavage planes at 90 degrees. So again, when you see these sort of rectangular blocky shapes, 
uh, that's telling you you have some sort of feldspar. In this case with the color, we can see that that's a, a case bar. Um, there's some plaids in here as well. Um, I'm sure there's some quartz in here. It's a little hard to see through the camera as well. Um, but yeah, there could, there's probably a little bit of quartz in there as well. But the most obvious thing here are these big uh, feldspar crystals. Um, one more granitic rock. This one I picked up this summer in near Shoup, Idaho, in the Salmon River country. This one actually has big feldspar crystals, but interestingly, um, it's what's called an orbicular granite. And so the feldspars tend to be kind of rounded in shape, which is kind of odd. Um, and I've done a little bit of reading on that. It seems like there's some ideas, but not a consensus on what exactly causes this. But we can see if I rotate it in the light, you can catch some flashes of color on these big feldspar faces that show uh, the cleavage planes there. So there's that. Here's a piece of diorite, which is um, a more intermediate form of an intrusive igneous rock. This is dominated by plage. Usually by the time we get to this type of magma composition, uh, case bar does not, is not found. Case bar is pretty exclusively a, a felsic mineral. So it tends to be just in granites, granitic rocks, rhyolites. So this one is kind of equal parts white and black, 50-50. We'll talk more about this rock uh, when we get to igneous rocks, but you can see the white plage filling in between these black crystals there. Um, okay, so that's some of the <clears throat> intrusive rocks. Let's look at some extrusive rocks. So these are rocks that erupted from a volcano. This is a great example of a porphyritic rock. It has really big crystals of plage, but the matrix, the actual material between uh, the crystals is a little bit more fine grain, but we can still see these really nice 90 degree shapes in the plage crystals. So you can see again, the, the, the cleavage planes in 90 degree, the rectangular kind of boxy shapes. They're not all, they don't all show the rectangular shape, but a lot of them do. You might sometimes find blobs in here. Like there's a blob, that one doesn't show the 90 degree cleavages, but in any given rock face that you expose, you should be able to pick out some of these little 90 degree angles in there. Uh, so that's sort of like an andesite or, or dacite. Uh, same thing here with this rock. We can see a lot of these white plagioclase crystals in here in this porphyritic rock. Um, then we get to basalt. Here's a really nice polished basalt. So darker matrix. This is a, a more mafic igneous rock, but then it is dominated by these very large, beautiful uh, plagioclase crystals, again, with the uh, kind of rectangular or boxy shapes and a lot of those 90 degrees. There's the, the nice polished surface. Here's more of the, the kind of rugged, rough surface there. Um, here's a similar one. This is from Idaho, uh, showing some of these crystals as well. So again, you can see these kind of needle-like or rectangular plagioclase crystals. Uh, and same thing here, also from Idaho. Let's get it in focus there. Again, a little bit more needle-like, but these are all plage crystals. And if you look at them up close, they have a lot of those rectangular shapes as well. So those are some of the igneous rocks we find um, with feldspars. Our last two rock types, let's talk about sedimentary rocks real quick. Um, feldspars are not very common in sedimentary rocks. It's softer than quartz and it has the cleavage plane. So those are two, two things kind of working against feldspars. Um, so in, member, in sedimentary systems, what we're doing is we're transporting the sediment. So we're taking a rock, maybe like a granite here or something like that, and then we're transporting it in a river. Maybe the wind is blowing it around. Maybe it's a, a landslide. Maybe it's a, a shoreline of an ocean, something like that. But there's energy moving the, the, the grains of sand or gravel or mud around. And so those grains of sediment are colliding. So if you're a softer mineral like feldspar and you're colliding with other minerals like quartz, which are quite common, uh, you're going to lose. You're going to get beat up. You're going to get broken, probably broken along the cleavage planes. You, have, you already have in your, your makeup uh, pre-existing weaknesses, these cleavage planes. And so the feldspars tend to get broken up pretty quickly into smaller and smaller material. Now there is a specific type of sandstone. So most sandstones, by the way, tend to be dominated by quartz. We'll look at those when we get to sedimentary rocks. But there is a type of sandstone called arcos, um, where if we have a granite, like one of these guys here, which has abundant feldspar crystals in it, um, and we break down that, that granite, weather it, 
transport it, but don't take it too far. So just maybe transport it down to the, the front of the mountains, maybe like an alluvial fan, uh, maybe not very far in a river system, so that we still have appreciable amounts of K-spar in the sandstone. Um, then we would call that type of sandstone an arcos. Um, so generally our definition there is if it has at least 25% K-spar, uh, it would be called an arcos. And here is a nice example of arcos. Um, again, this, this would show up so much better with uh, some magnification if we had you know, uh, a microscope, which we do, but uh, no way to kind of show that with the video as well. But in here, you can kind of see the overall color of the of the rock. Um, it's a little bit more pink than maybe some of your other sandstones. Let's do it this way. There we go. Um, so a lot of these grains in here, you guys you just have to take my word for it unless you were to look at it under a microscope. A lot of quartz in here, but a good number of these grains are also K-spar crystals, broken fragments of uh, potassium feldspar. So this would be an arcos. Okay, so... <clears throat> That's kind of it for sandstones. The feldspars do, spell, feldspars do not show up dominantly uh, in the sedimentary rocks. In the metamorphic rocks, they're quite common. Uh, they're common in gneiss and schist. I left a comma there. Um, I think they're also common in uh, amphibolite and maybe one other one. Uh, definitely the fine grain ones, but these are the two ones we're actually going to be able to see the feldspar crystals. Um, and this is this is a typo. Uh, we're not going to talk about quartzite. That was left over from last time. Uh, feldspars are not in quartzites. So there we go. Now it's correct. Common in nice and schist. Um, so we've got a few, <coughs> a few samples here. Put the tripod back up for this last little section here. Um, actually, let's start with this guy because it's quite large. This is actually uh, a nice, a metamorphic nice. You can see the overall banding running across it. Um, but the gneiss has within it some very large feldspar crystals that are kind of lens shaped. This is what's called an Augen gneiss. And Augen is a German word meaning eye. So these kind of resemble crudely uh, eyeballs um, or just their general shape. So this is an Augen gneiss with large uh, feldspar, recrystallized feldspar crystals within the gneiss, sort of forming the, uh, the, the fabric here, the, what we call the foliation, the banding running through it there. Uh, and then a similar one here, um, you can see the big, this one looks like it's mostly plaid, plagioclase feldspar augens, or uh, kind of, sometimes we call these porphyroblasts too. Don't wanna to give you too many crazy words. But these are big uh, crystals that have been uh, influenced by the pressure as this rock was squeezed in uh, in this direction, as this rock was squeezed underground, uh, that caused the minerals to align perpendicular to that pressure. And because these felt bars are, are still pretty tough, especially in, in, in the subsurface, uh, they retained a lot of their shape, but we don't see the crystal shapes, right? We don't see the 90 degree cleavage planes. Um, everything's kind of getting smeared out because the intense pressures are allowing for a lot of deformation of the minerals. And so there you go. So yeah, metamorphic rocks, gneisses. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, the igneous rocks. And so hopefully that was helpful. The feldspars, um, I think our next two mineral videos, we're gonna focus on the micas, muscovite and biotite being the two most common ones. And then we'll get to some of the mafic minerals like olivine, uh, pyroxene, hornblende, and spend some time with those as well. So hopefully these are helpful. Hopefully these are helping you identify some of your own rocks and minerals in your collections or out in your travels. Uh, appreciate all the support you can send to keep these videos going. There's a, a button, a donate button at the top banner of my YouTube channel, or there's always a link under the description. So enjoy, and we'll see you next time with um, Minerals with Wilsey.